Let's go, folks. Time for the Gibby Show. Hey, doing baseball fans, and welcome to another edition of the Gibby Show presented by Miller Lite, the official beer of Major League Baseball and the Gibby Show. I'm John Arezzi, and joining me, the two-time manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, member of the 1986 and the last world champions team for the New York Mets, <laughs> still a number one best-selling author on Amazon.com, the man who always tells it like it is direct from San Antonio, Texas, the Canadian baseball fan's adopted son himself, baseball lifer, <laughs> John Gibbons. John, how you doing? Done, doing good as usual, man. Just uh, looking forward to doing the show. Been watching a lot of baseball this week, and yeah, you know, and plus it was Canada Day. It uh, was, it was Canada yeah. Day, and uh, that's the one thing I just want to uh, briefly talk to you about. I mean, uh, John Schneider made some comments yesterday about uh, Toronto being the most unique market in Major League Baseball, and it's a special, it's a special feeling when you're representing a country. And you were there, obviously, for 10 years. Um, how special was that to represent a country and to kind of fall in love with a country like not only you did, but of course Schneider does, and almost everybody who plays uh, ever for the Blue Jays have always fallen in love with the country of Canada. Yeah, well, it's good and bad. You know, it's good because, you know, yeah, you're one team there, and, they, they, and people love you. And it's really, Canadians are unique in a lot of ways. You know, they're they're like, they, I've said many times they're hardworking, they're humble, they you give them a good effort, you know, they're fair, that all that kind of thing, right? And uh, you know, and they'll support you. You give them a good effort, you know, and and they'll they'll love you, you know. If you don't you don't try to BS them too much, you know, that's just kind. Of, they're good, hard nosed, uh, that kind of people. On the bad side of it is, you only got one team up there, so when you stink, you're not very good. They, you know it, about right? There's, there's no hiding it. Uh, then the whole country turns on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? They, I tell you what. It's it's uh, you know they're they're very demanding, but they it, they they give them a, give them a good effort and don't don't snowball them, man. Not li- yeah. Literally, don't snowball them. Well, certainly a lot of pride up there, and that was evident by the special game, uh, the Canada Day game, uh, where even there were Canadian, uh, uh, there were people uh, who got their citizenship at the game. So it was really very special to watch. But let's get to today's uh, show. We'll cover this week's Blue Jays news. Uh, We'll talk about the top teams in the American League who all seem to be running in place right now. And then today, uh, Gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons. Uh, What a special one we have. Former Blue Jays ace, winner of the AL Cy Young in 1996, member of the World Championship team in 93, special assistant for the Jays right now. Pat Henkin is coming on to join us. And then we'll have another roast and toast inspired by our friends at Miller Lite as well. But let's get right to the leadoff. Gibby, the Jays' inability to beat the AL East teams reared its ugly head once again this week. Uh, Jays being swept by the division rival Boston Red Sox in Toronto over the weekend. Boston had lost five in a row uh, coming into Toronto. Uh, The Jays are now 0-7 against the Sox this year. Um, They played sloppy baseball a good part of the weekend. From Bichette being thrown out at home on Saturday, Eris committed lack of urgency or fire, it seemed, uh, as someone watching the team. It seems really frustrating. Are they playing too casually right now? And uh, where's the fire right now for uh, for the Jays? You know, Johnny, it's – it. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm not an apologist for anybody, right? I, I, I do get how it works. You know, it's – it. it uh, but may you know it may may be that this team is they're not as good as they are built up to be. It doesn't mean they're not a good team. But I think kind of everybody thought, well, they're going to just you know run roughshod over everything, right? Guaranteed to get the World Series. That never happens that easy, right? And uh, you know you still, but you still can't lose sight. You know they're right there in the wild card hunt. Uh, and you know if, if 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 you sit back and look at things realistically, right? They went down there and and, and they. Two out of three from the Marlins, and they came back at two out of three from Oakland, and two out of three from the Giants. And the Marlins and the Giants were the two hottest teams in the National League at that point, maybe in baseball. And and then uh, you know, but of course, then you got the Red Sox. The, you know, there's one team every year that's your nemesis. I don't care what happens. You know, they they have your number. You know, it was just the opposite last year. 
the, the the Jays dominated Boston. I mean, it was so lopsided, which was very unusual because you know. But you look at you look at the Red Sox. It's almost like they've turned into a small small market team. You know, I don't know what's going on up there. You know, the the star power and things like that, the money they want to spend or whatever it is, and so it's basically a basic team. But for some reason, they have the, they they flipped it on last year. But they played seven games. They've they've got they've got got a few more. Bottom line, they're gonna have to play better against American League East. No question about that. And that needs to needs to change. But I mean, if you if you you know, I think what goes through. You know, everybody hears it in in, uh, and I'm sure Pat will even talk about it a little bit. But everybody hears the outside noise, right? But what happens internally is, you know, you worry about that today's game. Yeah, you you hear all the stuff, you get tired of answering questions, but you got to worry about today's game and try to win that. And then you worry about tomorrow. You can't worry about yesterday. Easier said than done, obviously, right? And so you know what? They just got to move on, chalk it up. Now, now they now that the schedule turns in their favor again. You know, go they go into Chicago, play the White Sox, and then you go to Detroit. Teams that they've they've got to get fat off of, you know. Um, but you know, I, I don't. I it, it's kind of it's kind of strange, you know. It's hard, it's hard to grasp it. You know, everybody's saying that this team's like a huge disappointment. I, I don't think that's the case at all. I, I think I think they're going to get there. And you know, I look at the Mets, the San Diego Padres, are disappointments. You know, yeah. Um, but 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 there, there's there's clearly it's it's just been one of these kind of Maybe it's a lot of parody in the game or something, or maybe they're you know what they're just not as good as the team they were built up to be because you know the baseball world can can inflate some things too now. You know they they you know they traded Tay Oscar, you know uh, to Seattle who was a big bat for him, but they got Swanson who's been dynamite in the pen. Then Guriel and you know they went out to uh, and Moreno went out to Arizona, and Varsho has been kind of hit or miss. That you know he he's got to he, you know sometimes it's tough when you go to a new spot, but he'll pick it up. But but. I think that's the area with a little more offense, you know, no, we're not asking all these questions, but that's, you know what, that's baseball as they say. It is. But I think the one uh, thing that you got to take a look at also is uh, the top 12 American league teams. I mean, since June the 9th, when you look at the top 12 teams in the American league, no one is overperforming. They're all kind of playing 500 baseball i mean from the o's uh, 10 and 10 uh the Sox are two games over 512 and 10 since june the 9th uh tampa the same the angels the same houston 10 and 11 seattle 10 and 11 uh toronto's 9 and 12 but no one is t- no one is taking the bull by the horns and seeing the opportunity because they're all kind of playing at this mediocre 500 level right now so that's got to be at least a uh, a positive when you look at what the Jays performance has been but now is the time to step it up you talk about the soft schedule and all of that you got to feast on these teams but with the way the Jays are playing is it really a soft schedule or they have to go out there and fight now at like every game to see if they can separate themselves from the pack well you know number one it's tough to win a major league game you know, I don't care who you're playing what what have you but it it uh, and these are major league teams. So soft schedule, yeah, you know, it's it's still not it's still not never that easy, right? In right. in the, but I still I still have confidence in this team. Like the, I think all their most of their fans do. Um, but it's just uh, maybe there's you know if you take out Tampa, who got, it got off to a historic start, they've come back to earth because they've had mm-hmm. some key injuries in the pitching, right? You take that out, bring them back to pack. It's 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 a very, uh, I mean, it's it's really all lumped together, which is kind of the way the game which is kind of unusual for the game because there's usually a handful of teams that are heads above you know the Dodgers are usually running away with it right now Atlanta is the only only Atlanta's the only one doing it you know the only one you look at you look at Seattle who's coming off you know the playoff year first time in a while you know where'd they go They're, they've disappeared you know the White Sox were supposed to be the, the talk of the town in that in, in that division and they're not doing it even Cleveland who won that you know they they're not doing anything, or they're they're just kind of sputtering along. That's just kind of the way it is. The world champs, yeah, kind of sputtering along. So I don't know. It, I guess the best way to describe it is a lot of parity out there. Some key there injuries is. to certain teams, and you know what? And sometimes we 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 get a little overly optimistic in this business, and maybe because without realizing, hey, it ain't that easy. Yeah, I mean, Kevin Gossman uh, had uh, some interesting comments. Um, because the Jays were picked to kind of like really be 
not totally dominant, but they everyone predicted them to be in much better situation they are right now. So Gossman said, I think we have a target on our back. It sounds bad to say, but people know how talented our team is, so they have to really bring it. And if you don't bring it, they're going to have a higher intensity uh, than us. Teams know how good we are, so they're prepared for it to be a dogfight. And obviously, uh, after the Sox won the first two games, they're playing with house money, says Gosman. Uh, so uh, they're going to be more aggressive and take more risks. Uh, pitchers are the same way. When you already won a series, you're going to do that. Uh, going into the third game, you can look at it a lot differently. Uh, how accurate uh, are those statements? I mean, uh, when your team feels like there's a target on your back and people are upping their game when they play against you. Well, I mean, uh, I think a lot of that happens if, you, if, if you're the world champs, you know. Uh, or, uh, you know, but, but he, he would know better than I would, you know, have the feeling. But you got to remember, too, you know, they, they – the so-called ace, you know, Gosman could be the ace, could have been the ace last year too, you know, but Manoa was kind of, you know, the, yeah, painted as that guy, deservedly yeah. so. You know, he he's not even in the picture right now. You know, you throw in, you throw in his kind of year last year, we're not having these discussions. And that's where it's so, it's so nice that Kikuchi and Barrios have stepped up. But, you know, there's a long way to go, okay. Uh, people are going to go, yeah, here goes Gibbons, you know, the apologist, whatever. No, I, be- I believe in this team. I don't think they're as strong as maybe the, the baseball world figure day would be, but that's okay. It doesn't mean they're not they're good enough to win it, right? right. So, uh, right. But, you know, it, it just shows you when you play 162 games every game, every day of the year, just or for six, seven months, whatever it is, you, it, it, nobody runs away with it in, in um, ever right or rare, rarely. Yeah, I mean, that's that's unusual. Even, even everybody, you know, when Tampa early in the season got off the – uh, incredible start you know you knew they were going to come back you had and because of the law of averages says that and that's kind of what they what's happened yeah uh, i do want to just touch upon one thing that happened over the weekend and that was that play at home played on saturday third base coach luis rivera initially waved bichette home when vladdy hit that ball it was the ninth inning Bo was rounding third base and then rivera was was put his arm up uh, and the bow hesitated for a second, but his momentum kept him going to home plate. He was thrown out easily. The game is over. Uh, who's to blame for a costly end of this Saturday's game, uh, or does the blame really belong to both Bo and Rivera? You know, I don't blame anybody for that. I've, I've seen it happen too many times. What happens? It's, a, it's such a such a big run. You know, you got to you got the. I can tell you. I guarantee. I can tell you what. Uh, you know, Louis thinking. You know, you got Verdugo out there, right? Who can really throw, right? Yeah, you know, and Vladdy hit it hard, but I mean, it's it's a it's a big run. There's two outs, you know. You're trying to tie that thing, right? And uh, and so he's got he's got to read him. He's he's looking. Louis looking this way towards right field. And he's got Bo out of the corner of his eye, so he's got to keep him coming. And then it's one of those going to be a last second stop, right? And yeah. I think what got him that, that confused Bo by his it, it didn't get both hands up high with a definite. Probably should have been down the down the line a little bit further. You know that's that's. You know what, what the happened. reality the the toughest job on the baseball field coaching job is the third base coach. Yeah. You know the the pitching coach, the manager, we can hide in the dugout, man. We can get away from him. not the not the third <laughs> base coach. He's got the pressure, man. He's got the pressure under the gun, right? And and, and you're uh, and, and you're, and you're you know you're in front coach. of forty thousand people. It's the ninth inning. That would have been the tying run. It, it, yeah. So there was so much going on at that point. Right. But it was it was yeah, so think, heartbreaking yeah, it, to see. Well, I think it, I think it confused Bo a little bit too. Because he's he's coming hard, and then he, he got caught in between, and uh, he, he hesitated. And then he said, "Well, you know, he did. Hey, I, b- I better keep going, right?" Yeah, you know? it's one of those yeah. things. That, but you know what? If you're scuffling, like in like I said, certain teams own certain teams. You're playing that team, and you're struggling a little bit right there. Those are the kind of things that happen. Excuses, yeah. no. But you know what? It ain't that freaking easy, man, to be a third base coach. And you know what? Yeah. It. Uh, uh, but they, they'll they'll be fine. I really uh, believe want- that. Yeah, I do want to touch upon uh, Alec Manoa made a, a double A start uh, over the weekend and uh, looked pretty good. I mean, his velo hit ninety five. He he pitched five innings. He uh, struck out ten. Uh, it seemed like his location uh, was there, and uh, he had an impressive 
performance and only uh, gave up one run over the five innings. Of course, it's not major league level. It's double A. But I, I still think uh, that maybe that's a little bit of a confidence booster for this young man who's trying to make his way back to the majors. Yeah, I think I think it was a good step for him, you know, especially after, uh, after you know, down in rookie ball, you know, he, he got he got hit out, hit around a little bit. But you know what happens? You go down to those real low levels. I've seen it, I've seen it too many times. It's rare that it goes really the way you want it because you get these young kids, man. They're excited. We're gonna we're facing Alec Manoa. And they're just swinging, man. They, there's no yeah. plan. They're just up there, right? Whereas you get to the higher levels, there's a little more of a thought strategies and things like that. And the pitcher usually, you know, or the or the hitter fares a little better, maybe. But but it very. Uh, Truthfully, very rarely do you see a, a major league pitcher down on a rehab or even a hitter dominate those things. You know, it just it just doesn't happen. For well, I don't know why that is, but I, all I can tell you is I've seen it too many times. The only good thing about it, you know, for the the guys on the the double A team is that uh, a major leaguer when they come down and perform, they they got to buy you they, they got to buy the post game spread. They usually get a nice one, man, lobster and steak. <laughs> they do right, so they, so they love it when the uh, big leaguers come down. <laughs> Well, uh, you are listening to the Gibby Show presented by Miller Lite. I wonder if Alec uh, Manoa got a bunch of Miller Lights for uh, the guys down in the minor leagues. Uh, so, uh, uh, with they may not be old enough. <laughs> they, that, that's quite true. They may not be old enough. But uh, um, Miller Lite, uh, certainly so happy to have them aboard with us, as we always do. It's a big uh, 4th of July week for everyone here in the States and, of course, Canada Day. Uh, Gibby, I'm sure that uh, you'll be partaking. I saw another post of yours on social media uh, talking about this week's show, and there you are. You were cracking one open. Hey, man, hey never hurts to have a great sponsor, does it? It, does, yeah. it, it doesn't at all. We, lo- we love our Tastes friends. like Miller, Miller time. Light, man. Always tastes like Miller time. Corner booths. Sticky floors. Weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite. Great taste. 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. Well, the uh, 2023 All-Star Game rosters are now complete, and the Jays do have four players heading to Seattle next Tuesday, and those players are uh, Bo Bichette makes his second All-Star Game appearance. Uh, Bo finished second to the AL starter, the Rangers' Corey Seager. Uh, Kevin Gossman gets the nod, his second All-Star Game selection. Whit Merrifield also got uh, – he will represent Toronto, uh, and it will be his third time going to the midseason classic. And finally, I think the guy that's probably more excited than anybody else is Vladdy. Uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. will make his third All-Star Game appearance, and he will also compete in the Home Run Derby. Uh, I, I'm sure everybody remembers 2019 when this guy hit 91 home runs in the Home Run Derby uh, and uh, lost by one home run in the last round in the finals against uh, Pete Alonso, and that'll be a rematch uh, at the All-Star Game next week. So it's going to be really exciting uh, Vladdy's looking forward to it. Uh, Jays are well represented. Uh, the All Star Game is always big as the Midsummer uh, Midseason Classic, but the Home Run Derby, John, is is kind of taking uh, limelight. I mean, it's like the event. Sometimes it overshadows the real game. What's your opinion of the Home Run Derby, and uh, how exciting is that for a player to be uh, in that in that tournament uh, like a Vladdy Guerrero? But is it taking away too much from the game? No, you know what? That's kind of like, yeah, you're right. That's kind of like the, the main draw now. Everybody looks forward to that. They, they really promote it. And uh, uh, and people have fun watching it. I, they made some rule changes in that. So it's not like you used to be, you got to where it was kind of boring. You know, you wait, you yeah. wait, wait, wait. And, uh, you know, I got to go to two all-star games and I had my kids down the field for those. It's, it's pretty cool that way. But there's also a lot of your top home run guys don't even want to be in it perform in it you know because they're worried about they need you know you think about that 91 home runs how many swings did vladdy take i don't think it really affected him that year but there's a lot of guys say it does affect him so hey whatever it's kind of like the uh wbc you know there's a lot of things you maybe don't like about it but they're good for the game and and uh well certainly uh love the all-star game and looking forward to it this year and uh with the jays having four players representing uh Canada and the Toronto well, four, nice. Yeah, two, four very good representatives. Four deserving guys, there's, there's no doubt about it. That'll wrap up the leadoff, and now it's time for Gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons. 
There is a reason to celebrate every day. Tim's new dream cookies are here. Dig into delicious flavors like M&M Minis, Reese's Ooh. Minis, and Rocky Road. They're Ooh. soft, chewy, and baked fresh throughout the day. Try one or a few at participating Tim's restaurants for a limited time. Yeah, I'm not going to go with just one. I got to have a few, Johnny. You know? I'm right there with you. <laughs> it, does sound, it, it does sound really good right now. I tell you what, they just keep putting that stuff out. So, And I was, you know what? I don't care what time of day. Get yourself a cup of coffee with it. Mm-hmm. Today on Gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons, it's a pleasure to welcome one of the most beloved pitchers in Jays history. He's a three-time All-Star, former Cy Young winner, helped the Jays with a World Series victory as they won the 1993 championship. He's also been a coach for the Jays and today remains with the team as a special advisor, and he's also a member of the 2016 Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame class. Let's bring on Pat Henkin. Pat, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. How you guys doing? Yeah. Uh, hey, Johnny, this is one of the all time great people. I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm just talking about had a great career. Just one of the great people. i you know, there's certain people in the game that if you bring up Pat's name, everybody, will, everybody will lights up. You know, uh, because he's one of the good guys. He cares. You know, he's moved on from his career and he's out there helping people. So. uh we're pretty lucky to get this guy because I know he's in demand, right? Did you- <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. In demand for my wife. Uh, <laughs> oh, you got you to go on a road trip here, man. Just get some break, get a break, huh? That's it. Yeah. No, my wife <laughs> hosts a really cool July Fourth party. So today is a we do it is a work day today for us. We uh we we have to get oh. the house. It's a cool family reunion, actually. It's pretty neat. Her family comes from all over. Someone's flying in from Texas. They come from Canada, Windsor. So it's cool. Wow, that is cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, Johnny, fire away. Well, I mean, we, we have a lot to talk to you about, obviously. It's great to have you here. Uh, but uh, first question for you, like everyone, you've been watching the struggles of Alec Manoa after his amazing 2022 season. Uh, but back in 1995, you were coming off two great seasons in 93 and 94 including the back-to-back All-Star Game appearances. But the 95 season, there were some setbacks for you. Uh, I want to ask you uh, kind of in a, comp- a comparison in a way, but how did you overcome that? And can you relate to what Manoa is going through this year uh, to maybe some of the struggles you had earlier? But I do have to also bring up, you did bounce back very well in 96, winning 20 games. And it just happened to be the year you won the Cy Young. So I'd love to hear your comparisons about your career and what Alec is going through right now. <clears throat> yeah, right. So when I got called up, you know, we got put in the bullpen back then. I was a long reliever. Uh, 91 spent the year in the bullpen, then went to Venezuela to get some more innings. Then 92, make the team out of spring training. I'm out of options. I make the team again, long relief. And then I finally get a chance to start in spring training of 93. Um, 93, Al Leiter beat me out. I go back to the pen. Uh, and Dave Stewart got hurt. I go back into the rotation. I win seven in a row. We have a great team that year. This is 93. It was early in the year. Like, they're still in April. And then um, when Stu got healthy, Leiter went back to the pen because I was doing well. And then, so 93 was good. We had a great team. I ended up winning 19 games. But, again, great support, great cast, great defense, great lineup, great bullpen. Like, it's you know, it's a team thing to get that many wins. I go into spring training in 94. I feel pretty confident that I'm on the team. I'm going to be in the rotation. I have a nice year the year before. I don't have that pressure of making the team. I go out in 94 and have a pretty solid year. I wanted to repeat what I did. 95, I come into spring training. And I remember, and that's a good message to share with some of the younger pitchers. I felt like I kind of was there. You know, I felt like I arrived. I'm the man. And if it wasn't for the support of A, my dad, B, my wife, but C, and just as important as A and B, was my teammates. And I had some teammates back then that helped me. David Cohn comes to mind. Uh, there was another guy in the rotation. I'm trying to think who it was. Anyway, David Cohn came to mind and he brought me aside and just said, Hey, he, we had just made the trade for him. And he just told me, Hey, you got to get back to the basics. And I'll never forget that. And what he means by the basics is very simple stuff. It's get ahead, get out of the middle, you know, first three pitches, get in the strike zone. Let's, let's own counts. Let's dominate the OOs and the one ones. And, you know, sometimes you fall, you fall away from that stuff. You, 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 start, you get caught up in the limelight, the distractions. Um, you know, shoot, man, the, the guy finished third in the Cy Young or fourth in the Cy Young last year. I think he's going to turn it around. I just think he's got to get back to the basics. 
Got it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you had any discussions with Alec uh, since his reassignment and uh, to talk about the ups and downs? Give him a little advice. I haven't. You know, you got to be careful there. You got too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Like we got guys. <laughs> that, yeah. We got guys that are on that beat. We got guys that are taking care of that right now. Uh, Pete Walker's got a great relationship with Alec. I'm sure that Pete's in contact every day so i have not had any messaging with alex i did see him in toronto i did see him in kansas city but that's about it at this point yeah and he had a good uh good night uh in double a i mean he paid uh 10 k's only three hits uh and if you look at it it was the most k's he's had in the game since october 2021 but it's only double a but i think it was maybe a good uh first step back to where he needs to be yeah, no doubt. So I saw that too. Ten punches through five. That's really yeah. good. Yeah. Probably had to break the ball going. You know, and I think it comes down to fastball command too. At times, fastball command can, can be hard to find for pitchers. And, you know, sometimes Alex goes through those stretches just like all pitchers. So I think it's going to come down to getting his fastball command better and getting that elite slider that he had last year, get it nice and tight. I'm really anxious about him pitching again five days from now. Yeah. Hey, hey Pat, you know what? It, uh, you know what you were saying earlier. I don't know, when we first got on the show was talking about you're talking about mindset, confidence, and and things things like that, right? And, and that's so true. Sometimes in, in this analytic world of baseball now, you know they check the spin rates, they check this, they check that. You know they 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 can. There's a lot of good in a lot of that stuff. But I agree with you 100. percent Sometimes you got. Do you remember it used to be even baseball? If if somebody was really struggling. They say, hey, hey, go out, go out, tie one on one night, man, or or, or whatever. Or something. Just get away, clear, clear your mind, right? Or don't take BP, or maybe don't th throw a bullpen, or whatever it might be, right? Just go out yep. there and let it fly. You know what? I, I think we've lost some of that in the game. And when when you made that statement, I said, you know what, Pat, Pat's a hundred percent right, man. The game's always been the basics, right? I mean, in in sometimes we overcomplicate it. We get too smart. You know, and, and if we just leave it, leave it with the basics, because, you know, the game's functioned one way for over 100 years, and there's been a lot of good players through every generation. It's sometimes that easy, but we just won't let it happen. No, I hear you, man. It's, it's, it's such a tough game. It's so hard to stay confident. I know, like, for myself, even after I won the Cy Young, you have games where you're like, man, you just start doubting yourself. And you're right. Sometimes hitters need to just take a day off, mix it up, do something different, skip a bullpen. Yeah. I had a two month stretch. I remember telling the pitching coach, how come my stuff's better on my side day all the time? My stuff's better on my side day on my game day. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's just coming out. <laughs> I'm like, man, fix it up. And he started laughing. I said, my side day, my curves tighter. My fastball's got more life. I'm like, I can feel it. I know. And he'd be like, I don't know. We'd skip a bullpen. So yeah, it is. It's hard to stay confident and you got to get back to the basics. Old school baseball is never going to go away. It's still here. It's still here today. It's still a really hard game to play. It's still a super fast game to play. And um, yeah, it, it, it's just um, it's just a tough game, man. It's hard to stay confident in this game. Uh, yeah. Hey, if people listen, and this is coming from a guy that won the Cy Young. Now, you know, we're not talking about average Joe. We got had a great, great career. We're talking about a, a, a super career. Hey, so I'm going to ask you, Pat, because you know, I was, you know, the, the game, like I mentioned a minute ago, is so different now. You know, it's everything's dictated. You know lineups. Uh, when if you're out if you're out there start at the starting pitcher, you know they track. Well, third time through all that all that stuff, right? Okay, and maybe there's some value in that, but I think we we get carried away. Your Cy Young winning year, you threw 265, maybe no two 265 and two thirds innings. You kidding me with that? That's like two years for most of these guys. I know. Uh, I I always tease my buddy, my buddy that I grew up with always teases me. He's like, man, that's pseudo gas. And he just don't take you out. He just won't take you out. <laughs> you know, um, you know what? I never threw over 125 pitches. It was a different era. I know I talked to Bassett and Gossman earlier this year about this. And they had asked me how many innings I threw the year I won my Cy Young. And I told them 265 and, he, and they were like, whoa. And I just looked at them and I said, it was a different era. I mean, there were guys that were throwing a lot of innings. I wasn't alone. There was other guys that did it. Hell, the next year I won, after I won the Cy Young, the next year me and Clemens threw 265 innings again. Um, it's just, it, I think what it does for me is innings was always important for me in my era, why I played. I think it came from my father. It was just one of those things where it was like, it was your job to give the team innings. And I was not an ace, ace, like my whole career. Like these Hall of Fame guys that have like 15 years of their sweet spot. I had like five years of sweet spot. 
You know what I mean? Like it was climbing to get to it. And then after the five years, it was kind of a decline. Where those Hall of Fame guys like Verlander and those guys, they just had that 15-year stretch, man. It's amazing how good they are. But um, anyway, I lost my train of thought. I got a little long-winded. Sorry, brother. No, dude. Hey, hey, okay, you say it was a different era. That wasn't that long ago, Pat. Come on. No, I, I think – I know. I, you know, I, I think – Let me, let me say this. My buddy called me the other day, and he says, hey, I just saw your name on MLB channel. And I said, what was it? He said, they said, since the wild card era – the most consecutive guy, the most consecutive games going six plus innings for starting pitchers since the wild card era. Number one was Verlander. Number two, he didn't remember. He goes, You're number three. I said, I'm number three. I go, How could you forget? No, I said, How could you forget number two? And he goes, hey. <laughs> 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 Making a big deal about Nola going 11 times in a row for the Phillies. He went 11 times in a row where he went six innings. And I think I had done it like 40 some and Verlander was the first at like, you know, 60 something. I don't remember. He didn't remember the number. He just remembers seeing Verlander, someone else and me. So yeah, it, it was a different era, man, but it was one of those things that as a starting pitcher, I didn't strike out a lot of guys. My biggest strength for the organization for the club was to give them innings. And that, so that's the way I looked at my job. You know? Well, yeah, you gave minis, but you also gave them wins, dude. That, that, you know what? It's not, it was, there's guys that go out there and give minis, you know, but they're, they're, they're behind six runs and they just eat up innings to later in the game. There's a, there's a big difference. Hey, would number of two, would, would number two or, or somebody in that mix, would that, could that have been Burley in there um, somehow? What, what, that, what you, no, I coached Burley, never got to play with him. Is that what you're no, asking? Oh, okay. No, I remember Burley, the consecutive game, you know, the six oh, plus. Oh, okay. Burley. I thought it'd be Maddox. I thought it'd be Maddox. Oh, I don't know. Maddox. Okay. Maddox, Cena, somebody like that, Messina or Maddox. or Because you remember, you can't get hurt. No, no, you're right. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Whoever it was, is pretty good company up there, brother. <laughs> he always told me, so Schilling was after you. That's what he told me. Uh. He's Name after you, which I was, you know, because Schilling was he was a great pitcher in my era. Oh yeah. Hey, well, you yeah. know what the you know what, Pat, that you did, that word right there, pitcher. I think guy, guys are more throwers now. There's no doubt. They go out there, even your top dogs, right? They come in, they go in, they air it out from first pitch of the game till they're done, right? And I and so I don't think there's the finesse, the 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 skill as much. Yeah, they they all have nasty stuff, but the, I don't think, you know, it's not like I gotta believe you. You, you know, you had a great arm, but you didn't max out the whole time. Did oh you? my god! Are you kidding me? The last five years, I was throwing eighty poo. <laughs> I, 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 it was like eighty nine. You know, I, I think that um, you know I relied on my fastball location, my stuff, my arm, and my fastball hook got me to the league. I got to the big leagues with my stuff. But in order to stay and have a sustainable career, I think at some point you have to learn how to execute because your stuff's not going to be what it was the year you break in versus your sixth year versus your 10th year. And there's such a small amount of people that make it 10 years. That's another amazing thing. And in order to do that, you have to keep changing pitch to pitch, outing to outing, year to year. And I think that that's what's happened. And you're right. Getting back to what you were talking about, we're drafting and developing guys that are, we're looking for swing and miss. I mean, the, the industry is looking for swing and miss. They want swing and miss. They want it in the, in the strike zone. And, and it's like we're encouraging pitchers to try to strike people out, but you're, you have 30 pitch innings. You have guys in the minor leagues that are going 0-2 to 3-2 because they want the punchy. They're chasing the right. punchy. punchy. And the guys in the big leagues are doing it too. Don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying I wouldn't be that guy. I'm just saying I think that's what's going through some of their mind. Is some of the minds is that, you know, they know punchies get recognition. Uh, strikeouts get um, paid. You get paid for it. And you get to pitch, pitch in high leverage situations. So I think as an industry, we're seeing – the less Frank Tananas, less Pat Hempkins at the end of my career when I was throwing 87, 89, you're seeing more guys that are just going to go three innings. They're hybrid. They're going to come in and rip it. And we're going to have 25 pitchers to get us through a major league season. And we're going to need a bunch of optional guys so we can just do play the yo-yo game with Buffalo. And I think that every organization is doing this. Right. It's, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's Hey, you know, you know, when you said that with the, at the end of your, your career, you were throwing what? 80, 89. Who was and one of my all-time favorite stories you told the story uh when you're in baltimore when when somebody adjusted the uh you might you want oh. can you tell that story the the radar gun <laughs> can you tell that please yeah so i i played against scott erickson for my whole career he was a great pitcher again with the twins and i when i signed with baltimore he was just coming off tommy john 
And I, I, I pitched with him and we got to know each other and I had a ton of respect for him. And he had a lot of respect for me. It was really cool. And we became teammates and all this. So we're talking and I was telling him how I'm struggling with, you know, my mindset and just my confidence and how, you know, I'm throwing 88 and I look up at the gun and I let one eat. I'm 02 and I want to throw a bow tie up and in. And they, and they, they, you know, I look up and it's 87. I'm like, shit. <laughs> so he says, so what, Pat? He's like, you, you can pitch like that. You've been pitching like that for like, it doesn't matter to you. Quit looking at the gun, you know? So I said, and I got 10 years in the big leagues at this time. I got like 11 years in the big leagues at this time. So he says, uh, I go out my next game in Baltimore. I go out in the first inning. I get 02 on a guy and I let it eat. And I look up and it's like 91. And I'm like, holy cow, man. And, you know, I started having that confidence. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I get out of the first inning real easy. I come in and, and our pitch coach's eyes are like deer. He goes, man, the ball's coming out of your hand, man. Looking good today. I said, yeah, it feels good. You know, maybe my arm stuff's working. You know, I'm thinking all the stuff I'm doing in between starts. <laughs> so I pitch six innings. I give up like one run. I'm in my locker after the game. I'm real happy because I was struggling with my mindset. Erickson walks up to me. And he's like, hey, man, how'd you pitch today? I said, I, he goes, how'd you feel? I said, man, I said, you see that shit? I said, it hit 90. He goes, hey, man, I just want to let you know that I, I told Rudy to jack the gun up four miles an hour. For like every <laughs> <laughs> so he says every 91 was like 86. I was still throwing 80 poo. But I'll tell you what, um, it just goes to show you the mindset, the confidence, the swagger. How do you convince yes. yourself? How do you convince yourself to feel that way every fifth day? I'm in year 10 in the big leagues. I am financially secure. My family, you know, all that's good on the off the field, all that. And yet you have a young guy and he's trying to deal with this kind of thing. He's a young guy trying to make a team. You've got the pressures of making a team. You've got pressure of a wife. you got pressure of the media. And you're worried about your velo. Every pitcher throws and looks up. They, they, they look up every pitch. And it's just a bummer. It's a bummer. I'm so grateful I got to play the first half of my career where they didn't show the velo. And the second half they showed the velo. <laughs> because I remember telling the GM in Toronto, Gordash, you can ask him. Get him on your podcast. I said, Gord, would you turn that radar gun when I, don't, when I pitch? Could you turn that shit off? He's like, what? Hey, why do you want that? I said, I don't want that or know when I'm throwing 89, man. <laughs> and, and, you know, Clemens is pitching af after me, and he's coming in pumping 95 with 90-mile-an-hour splits. And I'm, I'm I used to tell Clemens, too, I could win every game if I had your shit. That's what I told him. <laughs> I said, you're changing us my fastball. Oh, yeah. But it's amazing. Rudy, the Orioles, Erickson, he, he fudged the gun. It was amazing. It had a huge effect. I tell that story a lot because I, I really, truly think it holds some of the players back. In our level, in some of our levels, just the mindset. That's all. It's not holding anybody back physically, you know. But. Well, Pat, Pat, you're 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 a very you're probably the most humble guy I know. Okay, <laughs> okay, we, we know we, we know what your you, what you did out there in your career, how how it went. But what you're saying there is is so true. It's you know whether young whether you're talking about young kids or just trying to figure out the game, or even seasoned veterans or Cy Young winners. I think fans they really don't know that players deal with that all the time you know they think uh you know they, they, these guys because you guys go out there and make it look so easy but it's really a mental battle over and over till 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 you till your career is over you know and then you sit at home and you really like me and it really eats you alive you know because you ain't got nothing going on yeah <laughs> but it's uh and then you end up on podcast but i, t I tell you what it's uh you, you had you had an unbelievable career introducing new dream cookies from tim's i got tim's they're baked fresh throughout the day. And every bite is a soft and chewy way to celebrate your everyday. It's time for dream cookies. It's time for Tim's. Johnny, what do you oh, got for him? Yeah, I mean, he, he certainly had a wonderful career, but uh, wanted to go back uh, in time a little bit. You gave a lot of credit to catcher Charlie O'Brien during that Cy Young season in 96. How important was Charlie uh, to you that year? I mean, I, I you know, read up, a little bit about how he just kind of made you change the way you thought a little bit and tell us about that relationship with Charlie and how it helped you that year. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually, he wanted me to say hi to Gibby. I talked to him today, told him I was doing your podcast. Yeah. So I, I talked to Charlie. I still talk to Charlie quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so here's the deal. I, he comes over from the Braves as our backup. We have uh, Benito Santiago, I believe was the starting catcher at the time. And I was a big Greg Maddox fan. I can actually turn my Zoom camera and show you my Maddox jersey. It's right here. <laughs> I, I, I loved I loved Greg Maddox. I loved watching him pitch. I just loved him. So when Charlie came over from the spring training, I got to know Charlie right away. I went straight up to him because I like to know my catchers. 
And I got to spend 30, 45 days in spring training talking to him and talking about Maddox. And then uh, he actually never caught me in spring training. It was the weirdest thing. And, and at some point, I remember telling the pitch coach, hey, I'd like to throw to O'Brien once before spring goes, you know, ends. And I think I ended up throwing a few innings to him at the end, but that was it. We go to start the season. We go into Anaheim. I got the home opener. I think we opened up on the road. I can't remember. So uh, I got the home opener, and, I, and I, I went through the first inning, and he kept throwing down and away, and my ball had a little cut to it. Now I'm throwing righties. I'm going down and away. Lefties, I'm staying away, doing my normal with the lefties. And um, the righties, he, he was pitching away more than I had normally done. So the first inning went go went okay. Second, I didn't do anything. I didn't shake. Next thing you know, I I'm in the seventh man. I've only given up one run, and I and I hadn't shaken. I hadn't shaken yet. I haven't shaken once. So I said, and I, I I realized after the game, I talked to him. I said, hey, we didn't win a lot. I, mean, I remember being on the rubber, just going, there's no way we could go away. <laughs> like I've gone away like six times in a row. Like there's no way I could. And Charlie's like, you're pumping it on the black, bro. They can't touch it, man. So. This that game ends. We win the game like three to one. And I remember uh I, I think I went seven. And uh the next day we're talking, and, and that led to my next side day. Back then when Gibby and I played, well, the backup catcher caught your side. And and uh you got to learn a lot when you threw your side. He got to learn you, and I got to learn from him. So he caught my sides. Next thing you know, he's I said, Why are we throwing away so much? And that led to my Cy Young, man. That led to my Cy Young. I really believe that because the first five years of my career. I pounded all those hitters and I had a hit long history of those guys saying, get ready, man. Cause he's coming in. Cause I came in on almost all the righties. Pat borders, my catcher, we pounded guys. Cito liked me to pitch that way. And we just pitched guys that way. So I set a hell of a precedent for five seasons, man. Then all of a sudden O'Brien comes over from Atlanta away, 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 in, away, 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 you know, and next thing you know, I'm in the seventh and I just got into that honey hole where I was just hitting the glove. He yeah. was calling it. And, I got to tell you, there were times when I didn't, there were pitches. I was thinking, there's no way we should call this, but it worked. And I wow. learned, and I, I learned from him. I learned how valuable down and away was. And I learned how valuable and how important it was. And, and to be honest with you, I probably pitched next to four or five years in the big leagues only because I could do that only because I could throw down and away when you throw 85, 90 in the big leagues, even though that the gun's a little different now, maybe it's two, three off than what it was, but either way you have to locate. I mean, I'll give you an example. We got a guy, well, there's lots of guys. I'm not going to mention anybody. We got guys that throw 97 to 100. And if you don't locate, you get squared up. And 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 I think that's what uh, Charlie taught me, is that it's it's not always about your stuff. It's about being able to hit your spots, being able to throw the ball down and away. And, um, yeah, it really helped me a lot. He helped me a lot. He was a great catcher. He, he also uh, instilled confidence. He also was good at getting in your butt, too. Boy, he can get in your butt. He can get in your ass in a hurry. You know, out there. I remember one time. I'll tell you a quick story. So I get long winded. Give me sorry. No, but we I, love it, dude. Enjoying it, enjoying it. I'm on the mount, and it's like the it's like the seventh. Or, it's late in the game. We're in Toronto. I'll never forget this. Mel Queen pitch coach comes out, and he's standing on the mound, and he looks at me. I'm on the rubber, trying to be as big as I can, right? Standing up on the rubber, like trying to keep big. <laughs> and Charlie's got <laughs> face me. He's got his back to home plate, like he always did. Mel's standing right here. And Mel says to me, how do you feel? And before I could answer, O'Brien goes, he's done. He's so done. His, he's done. You got to get him out. He's done right now. <laughs> and Mel goes, Mel goes, can you give me one more? I got Pleasac ready for the guy on deck. And, I, and so that night we get in the shower and I said, Charlie, I said, what's, I said, you can sugarcoat it a little bit. He goes, you were done, man. You were so done. He's like, you, he's like, you had nothing. I had to tell the dugout, you had nothing. <laughs> oh, God. That's awesome. Great catcher. That's a great catcher who, yeah. and he, you know, I'm his friend, and he had a lot of respect for me. And we were salt and battery, won my Cy Young that year. And he still had the, the sack to say, hey, team first, we want to win the game. And I think that we get back to what Gibby mentioned about the analytics. I think too, not enough people are focusing on winning the game versus what my, you know, how my stuff is. And, and, you know, I'm looking for my personal stats or whatever. I think that that is lost a little bit with all the analytic rush. You see a lot of more. I think you see a little bit more individualism. I mean, there's always been that in baseball, but you know, I think with the analytics, it's really separated guys from a statistics standpoint. What's the yeah. uh, what's your opinion on the pitch com and all the changes that were made um, with that? I mean, I'd love to get your opinion on uh, the changes yeah. with the pitch com. So I'll, I'll go on the record here with the changes. Uh, don't like the guy on second base and extras. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no one does. We hate that. Yeah. Turning it into like 30U. 
You know, it's like 15, 15 you. I mean, come on. I mean, runner on second and extras. I'd rather see a shortstop pitch. Um, the other one is um, I love the pitch clock. I think the pitch clock is fantastic. That wouldn't have affected me at all, by the way. I pitched pretty quick. We were taught that way. I think it affects the hitters more than it does the pitchers, to be honest with you. Pitchers are ready. Put some more in a mindset, attack mode. Um, guys were dicking around behind the mound way too much. And the hitters, too. So I, I, so I like that part, too. I love the pitch clock. I don't like the three batter minimum. I think that what we've created is a, 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 a lineup block. Like they'll say, this is a block. You know, it's like, is there really more strategy now? you got to bring a guy in. He's got to stay for three now. I think there's actually less strategy because right. you can't even hook the guy. It's like in the National League, at least in the, in the American League, it, you know, you had the DH. I get it. But in the National League, it was easy. You just pinch it for the pitcher. If you were the manager, nobody ever second-guessed you. Why'd you hit for the pitcher? Oh, you know. It's easy to take a reliever out in the National League. You you can't run a reliever back out there because you might hit. You know what I mean? It's easy to pull a guy. and the, So, I mean, it's, it's a strategy thing. So, I love the pitch clock. Uh, I don't like the runner on second. What's the other one? Oh, the bases being bigger. That seems I don't. That seems like a moot point to and me. And the pitch com. I mean, calling your own pitches. I mean, you know. The pitch com for me, you know, I, I, don't, I didn't really like it at first because I like the fact that hitters can steal the signs from second base. I think that was a cool part of baseball, but I, I, I think we missed that. I don't know why they, they use the pitch com. I don't really think it's any quicker, but I guess is it like you're trying to tell me that a catcher can't just put the signs down just as fast as he can hit that thing, yeah. hit the butt in guard. I feel like – and then the other thing is too, like I think you got guys that are afraid to stare. I mean afraid to uh, shake because they don't want to run out of time. And, and I hate to see guys in the big leagues rush. I mean, that's like putting a clock on tennis or golf or something. Well, that's a Bassett thing, too. You know, Bassett was so methodical when he pitched for the Mets last year. And even this year, he's had a few struggles. And because he 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 took a lot of time in between pitches. So I think that might have affected him a little bit. And and now he just kind of threw up his arms and said, I'm going to let the catcher call the game. I'm not even going to try to do that anymore. Yeah, I, I like that strategy, especially if you're struggling a little bit as a pitcher. It's always good. We talked about it earlier about just mixing it up, skipping a bullpen, whatever you want to talk about. Maybe you can just have the catcher call your game. Sometimes it's just like someone taking a 10 pound bag off your shoulder and your necks and just letting you relax and just let, let me just be a yeah. working bee. Let me just be a working bee and hit the glove as opposed to now I got to figure out, was he late on that? Was he out in front? You know, is it, even though instinctively all that stuff happens when you're pitching, it's just nice to have a catcher that puts it down, especially if you're on the same uh, mindset. It, it feels good to think, oh my gosh, he wants to go heat her in. That's what I was thinking. That, that's a cool feeling, too. And if you call your own pitches, you never get that. And I think that, you know, he might get that a little bit as well when he when he lets the – I know just recently he pitched, he let Kirk call the whole game. He did well. Yes. Hey, Pat. Yeah, he Pat, when you talk about – hey, Burley. Burley never called his own – Burley never shook off a catcher. He probably had about 10, 12 different catchers in his career. In the, in the we, we, we had him on the show. He said, yeah, I figure if I make a good pitch, it doesn't matter. You know, I may give up a hit. I'm not going to give up much damage, you know, but – yeah, it's that guy, it's respect for that guy, Burley. I that's one of the most I, I respect that guy. I got the coach there with you, and and having him on the team was uh, he taught me some things, and he was just um, just an incredible machine when it came to repeating his delivery and hitting his spots. An absolute machine. No, I never. I mean, I saw Clemens, I seen Stewart and Steve and Cone, and uh, seen some great pictures in my time. I never seen anybody like Burley hit the glove like this. I mean, there were no misses. He would warm up, you guys, and I had a clicker in my pocket, and he would throw the exact amount of pitches every time, like to the T, and he, he wouldn't miss his spot. I mean, he'd go the whole warm up and not miss his, the glove. And I'd be, and Pete would look at me, and he'd be throwing 81. And Pete would look at yeah. me, and Pete would walk, <laughs> he'd walk or get up real close to me like this. I'm doing in the Zoom. He'd go, stay close to the phone, would you? And I <laughs> oh yeah, stay close to the phone. I'm like, okay. Eight innings later, the phone would ring. Bring, yeah, bring it. Exactly. What? <laughs> awesome. He I'm was like, amazing. He was amazing. I think his stuff wouldn't light up the analytic chart right now, but I think his ball was late. So if they can figure out a way to measure lateness, his ball, all four of his pitches came out of the same tunnel. And they were right there with the same tempo, same delivery, same release point, same. Like, I would love to put him on the track, man, and all the data to see how consistent he was to hammer in that spot. Same with, like, Halliday. You know, Roy was like that, too. And, yeah, um, yeah I loved Burley, man. I just hey. loved him. That team, hey. remember that team? He's beats for the plane. <laughs> Say that again. Remember I, saw, that I texted you he needs two seats for the plane leaving Tampa? Oh. 
<laughs> yeah. You can uh, your podcast. Uh, hey, you know, it, hey, Burrow had no no care in the world, man. He, the only thing he cared about where where he was going to go hunt, hunting during the off season. That's all he worried about. Yeah, he was an absolute machine. It was incredible to watch him pitch and work. He was in good shape too. People, didn't, you know, he didn't run a lot, but he worked hard in the cardio room, and he was a bull, man. Big, strong dude. You know what else he told me? He only did the shoulder program that the team he was with. I said, do you still do the shoulder program? Because he never missed a game, by the way. No. He threw like 15 straight seasons. He was a machine. He goes, he said, I do the exact shoulder program to the rep with the team that I'm with. I said, you mean you did it for the White Sox for eight years and you went to the Marlins, did it for a year? Then you're now you're with the Jays and you're doing our program? He's like, that's right. I said, why? He said, because if I get hurt, I'm doing your exact program to your rep, to the exact T. And he said, that's yeah. what I do. He's like, they pay me a lot of money. I'm going to do exactly what they say. You know, he was just a, he had a, he was just a cool guy. I liked him. Oh, and p- plus he, n- he never went into the uh, pregame meeting with the pitching coach and the catcher. He said, hell, if I'm, if I'm not calling anything, what do I care? What do I got to be in there for? <laughs> he said, he just, can you just kind of show up? Because guys look up to you, man. Can you just kind of show up in there? And don't ask any questions. Just stand there with a coffee. <laughs> oh, gosh. That is beautiful, yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. Incredible. He was a hell of a competitor. Good player, man. Great player. Hey, hey you've had some, you know what, your days at Toronto, uh, you had you pitched with some great ones, man. You played with some great ones. Is there is there a few guys that really stick out that uh you know, I know you talk about yeah. you just talking about Charlie, Charlie O'Brien, but uh is, is there yeah. other guys that um yeah, for sure. Uh well Charlie Pat Borders, Charlie O'Brien from the catching standpoint for sure. Uh Ed Sprague, my third baseman. Uh, he, we were good. Uh, we were tight. We helped each other stay confident. We helped each other. I think looking back, uh, being that hook partner, you know, somebody you could talk to and not worry about being embarrassed or something, you know, yeah. Uh, pitching wise, I would say Jack Morris and Dave Steed, man, those two guys, yeah. Tom Hankey and Dwayne Ward had a lot of impact too. Uh, Paul, oh, I forgot Paul Molitor. I forgot. I got to three years. He was our DH and I was a starting pitcher all three years. So I got to sit right next to him. It was cool. It was so uh. cool. Yes, he managed the game while he sat there because he was bored DHing. So he'd sit there and like we'd lean to each other. Should we pitch out? Should we not? You know, like this is a good time to throw a hook. And I remember he was the first guy that told me I should try to start locating my curveball. He said, I think you're at the stage of your career now where you can do that. And I, I really? remember thinking, hoping to throw it in the box. <laughs> What's he talking about? I was like, locate my curveball. I was just trying to throw it in the strike zone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dave, Dave, Steve, Jack Morris, and um, you know what, man? When I broke in, we had a really cool group of veteran guys, man. It was win first. It was always about winning. I remember I just – I broke in. I got lucky. I was on a World Series team. 91, I got called up. We lost to the Twins. Twins lost – Twins won the whole thing that year with Puckett, Kirby Puckett in them. And that was Jack Morris's 10-inning game. was 91, so I got called up that year. We were in it, man. We lost to the Twins that year. Then 92, we win it. 93, we win it. I'm thinking, holy cow. And then 94, we didn't sniff it, in, you know, the rest of my time in Toronto as far as the playoffs. But I would say the impact there would be uh, Dave Steve, Jack Morris, uh, of course, my father, and um, some of the catchers that I mentioned. Yeah. I got lucky, yeah. man. Incredible pitchers, man. I played with some incredible – Dave Stewart. Dave Stewart, Dwayne Ward, uh, Tom Hankey. Like, I played with some good ones, man. They, Jimmy Key. Jimmy Key. Oh, remember? yeah. He's the one that taught me to slide. Stay. He's like, you got slide step through your fish. I was like, what? Yeah, you know, I didn't. You know, a slide step through change up. You know, that was stuff. That's like next level stuff. You know, I wasn't ready to do that when I got called up. You know, but I. But he was that. Like, we shared information like that. And another guy, one guy, I tipped my pitches. One of our position players came out and helped me and said, "Hey, man, you're flaring on your hook." And I was only a two pitch pitcher, so good luck, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, my yeah. stuff was. So, you know, and, and um, you know, so like the guys helped each other and, and uh, tried to, tried to, um, I don't know, man. We just had, we had a good team. It was a good team to, to break in on. Yeah. They, you know what? They, that, yeah. I can, I can remember you back in those days. I wasn't a very good player, but yeah, there was, yeah, you, you know, you didn't have all these coaches. Now, now I think there's like 15 coaches on a staff in there. You know what? It's, it's actually more. I, it, uh, I heard this that there's, there's baseball operations now that, Cost of baseball operations is equal to players' salaries for the first time. Dang. There's there's a team. I don't want to mention it, but there's a team in baseball. And I'm pretty – I don't – you know, I don't have like – you know, I'm not – you know, I got decent evidence of it. I mean, I heard I heard this. Right. So take right. 
take it for what it's worth. But that's amazing, right? That a team would spend as much on baseball ops as they would on team salaries. You would never think that would happen. You know? No, and don't and don't tell me the game's better, whatever you do. Please don't try to tell me that. Anyway. Yeah. But we're crusty old old timers. We naturally get a little bit no, I'm with you though. I think the biggest telltale sign was like I think five years ago when they said that there were more strikeouts than bat baseball base hits. And that had never happened in MLB history. And I thought, boy, that's not a good stat. I don't like that stat. I don't like when guys strike out because it's boring. It takes a long time. It takes like four to five, sometimes six, seven pitches to strike the guy out. And it's just boring. It takes forever. I like the ball to be put in play. I think the late 80s was actually 80s. I think the 80s era was a great era uh, when guys put the ball in play. Maybe you struck out 170 times, you got sent down. Now you can strike out. Yes. Now you can strike out 170 times and make 20 mil, you know, and be yeah. like a super high end player. You know, nobody, it's nobody, nobody frowns on it. Even, I was even watching the Blue Jays game yesterday, and it was that one inning, the, the Red Sox, even though they end up winning, they first and third, no outs. It was the bottom of their lineup, right? They all three of them punched it, you know, and but Mesa in the it was a Swanson was next were good, but it's like the, these these are your like your 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 contact guys, right? They put it in play, they're gonna they're gonna score a run, but it's whiff whiff whiff. whiff yeah. But nobody cares. The game doesn't nobody care, you know. Yeah, so. that's a classic example. Yesterday's game, I was watching that game. You could have left the lefty in because you got a runner on first to keep that runner closer, you know. Or I, I it was a right handed hitter, so you're not holding the runner. And I was, and you, you know, you can always argue those things when you're managing. I'm preaching to the choir with you, brother. But you oh know, yeah, it's amazing all the things that must go through your head as a manager because you didn't have the three hitter block, right? Or you did? No, no, yeah, that makes no sense. That takes away all strategy. Plus, well, even another bad rule I think is the uh, you can only throw over a couple times. Oh yeah, you know, I forgot so the, about that one. I don't like that yeah. one either. You're right. In the you, ba- you, about that, you know what? I talked to the pitchers in spring training. I think they're dead on. I think you should be able to throw over as much as you want. Yeah. Not a big yeah. deal. No one yeah, throws other, over three times anyway. No, right? but, but just they, you're, otherwise you're just saying, okay, well, well, well if, if he throws over a couple of times, well, it's your free bag. Even like even like the, the, the base, bases are bigger, so it's actually shorter distance. And I, yeah. and I even saw Rick, an article by Ricky Henderson a couple months ago. He says, uh, well, you shot out of 50 stolen bases to my record uh, each of those years, right? And he's right. I mean, why short? I mean, the game first, why alter those kind of things? Because we're trying to, but anyway. No, I'm with you. I agree. Why would you alter those rules? I agree. I don't get that. That's, uh, it's, yeah. it's an insane. I, I'm, I'm surprised. I don't, you know, it's just like the guy, extra innings, the runner on second. I, I, I mean, clearly the players voted for this. And yeah. then maybe, maybe they didn't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think the pitch clock's the rule that I do like. Other than that, I think the rest of them, not so sure I'm, I'm sold on them yet. I got you, brother. Well, all right, Johnny, you got anything left for this superstar right here, man? Uh, he I, got, our, I just got one got, more. Well, he's got some work to do. He's got to go clean the house or fix up the yard, man, for the 4th of July <laughs> festivity. Yep. Well, I mean, great uh, stories today. And uh, I just want to ask you one uh, last thing. Uh, what's your most memorable Gibby story that you could share with us? You want to know what's crazy about Gibby and I? I'll tell you what. He probably doesn't even know this. In 04... My last year playing, I was going through a really tough time mentally. And I used to go out in the dugout before the games all the time on home and away. And I did it all the time, even when I was pitching good. And he did the same thing. And, and he does some, he probably doesn't even remember this because he was a coach at the time. He wasn't the manager. This was 04. And uh, he just sat out there like I sat out there. I think we both kind of wanted to get away from the music. I don't want to speak for you, Gib, but that was kind of what it was back then. <laughs> I, I was from the loud music in the clubhouse, and it was peaceful back then. When I played at 2 o'clock, 2.30 at the, at the ballpark, you'd have nobody out there. there was, it was quiet. It was peaceful. I, I enjoyed going out there and just – and Gibby and I would talk shop. And, and I remember he oh, talked. I remember. Yeah. Oh, do you remember this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was struggling, man. I'd have like three, four good innings, and I'd have that one inning where I just didn't have the stuff to strike a guy out and get out of it, you know, and it lead to that three, four run inning. And then, you know, statistically it's a bad game. Teams having trouble coming back. And, you know, you, you were trying to help me with that back then. And then I remember just being having that relationship and helping me like that. Because as a pitcher, you don't get that relationship with all of your coaches. You know, some of the hitting coaches, they don't even want to talk to you. It's like they just say hi to you sometimes. That's it. Gibby wasn't like that. And, and then the other thing is, is when, when Pete called me, when he got the manager's job, and I don't know if you know this, I've never shared this with you. 
Pete calls me and he says, uh, Hey, you know, who do you think I should get as my bullpen coach? And we started naming names and all this. And, and I said, he says, you think, would you do it? I said, would I do it? I said, I just did it a year ago. I stepped down. I go, I go, Alex is going to want to bring me back. He, I, and he goes, he goes, I think he might. He goes, I, and I go, I go, I don't know. I go, I go, what about Gibby? He goes, he goes, Gibby, I think would like you. I go, I love working for Gibby, man. I think, I think that'd be sweet. So I started thinking to myself, gosh, man, I can't believe that I do the bullpen. I stepped down to go back to special assistant. Now, because of you becoming the manager, now I'm going back to do, well, you and Pete, obviously, because Pete was a bullpen coach the year before, and then he took the right. job. Yeah. So I yeah. got a chance to be your bullpen coach. That's, that's the reason why I took it again, because I knew the culture and, the, and I knew what kind of culture you would create. Because so I remember you when you were here before, you know, you know like the first time. So I, yeah. I don't know. I, just, I, I, that's, I don't have a ton of great Gibby stories. I guess that's one. I mean, I could talk about the one with, with uh, the lefty. You know, with uh, I can't remember his name, the lefty where you had the issue with the ball. Remember you? Oh, uh, Lily. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 no. He knows no. that. Story. I don't know that story. I just know what I've heard. Um, but I don't have. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I remember. Oh, one time in Cleveland when you got in Jansen's ass. That was pretty good. <laughs> uh, I could tell dude, this about. Hey, I don't get along. I don't get along with the malcontent. Uh, <laughs> I had never seen that side of you, and I was like, damn. You know, I remember Chance came in for some bullshit reason, and I was in there, and I can't remember, and I didn't get a chance to block him from coming in. Otherwise, I would have. And uh, I remember you, you put him in his place. Yeah, I remember that. I don't know. You probably uh, did that. But anyway. No, yeah. you know, Pat, man, you know what? Hey, I was, was so fortunate. Coach, it was fun coaching for Gibby, man. Hey, it was hey, I, hey, I was so fortunate the coaching staff I, I had, you know. And you you're right there at the top of it, you know. And with Appreciate you can go that. on, you can go on and on. And, and uh, because the the coaches do all the work, the manager, you know, they they get the they 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 answer to the media. They right. they're like they're like the face of it. But in reality, the coaches do all your work, you know. And you got to let them. You can't be micromanaging. You can't, you know. They're but they're good. They're the experts in that area. Let them do their job. And I was so fortunate, man. I had so many good ones over the years. Made my life easy. Yeah, you did do that. I agree. I think Cito did that. I think a lot of the managers that I had when I played did that. I agree. But you got to also remember that the manager creates some culture and you got to give yourself yeah. some credit. You know what I mean? Some looseness, uh, you know, some, you know, I'll get in your ass if I have to, but let's have fun kind of thing. I always, I always bring up that Derek Jeter quote when he said, if you're not having fun at baseball, man, it's, you know, it's wrong. so hard. Yeah. You got to have fun. You need a goofball like me, man, running around your locker room because I was yeah. Playing. I was told I was a lefty trapped in a righty's body when I played. That's okay. <laughs> but anyway, it's a culture that the manager sets, too. There's part of that, along with your coaches, you know. Oh, you're right. Well, listen, yeah. partner, man. What, hey, it is so good to see you, man. What a pleasure to have you on here and tell some great stories, man. You, uh, Hey, you look back on your career. You, you're, you're, I told you you're a humble guy, but when, other, when myself and John and other people, you had an unbelievable career, you know, and to win a Cy Young and to be a part of championship teams and and right. uh, be one of the Love good guys and one of the favorites in all time in Toronto. It says a lot about you, man. You know, and uh, appreciate we appreciate it. you coming on here, brother. Anytime. Thank you so okay. much, Pat. Hey, you get to are, work. Get to work, man. You got the honeydews. <laughs> hey, wait. No. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, hey. up. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Uh, Pat, say hello to the fam, buddy. All right, see you guys. If you're ever in Detroit, we'll text me. Text me if you're well, in Detroit. The Motor City, man. The Odor City. <laughs> see ya. See you, brother. Right, guys, thank you. Wow, what a great guest he was. And, and Gibby was everything you said he was going to be. Yeah, you know what, Johnny? Hey, Pat's a special guy, you know. And, you know, he had a tremendous career. He won the Cy Young. He was part of great teams. But there's more to, there's more to him than that. You know, he's just one of the good guys. That He's one of those guys when any time he showed up, you got excited, put a smile on your face. Not just coaching staff, but players, right? And people, everybody gravitates to him, to him because, you know, like you talked about the positive thinking. And here's a guy that was on top of the world. And he, you know, he went through some battles too, the confidence battles, and how he overcame that. And that he's just such a feel-good guy. He can, uh, it can, 
it can it can put you make you feel like you're on top of that mountain again. Yeah, and he uh, certainly gave a lot of credit to uh, some of the people that have been uh, influential in his career. So a humble guy, uh, just a great guy, great storyteller, and what a great guest uh, on Gabbing with Gibby today. Uh, it was wonderful, John. Very, very cool. Yeah, top-notch guy. Yep. Absolutely. But uh, now it's uh, time, uh, inspired by our friends at Miller Lite, it's time for another Gibby's Roast and Toast for the week. And John, I have to uh, ask your indulgence uh, personally. I have a personal bone to pick this week, so I've decided I have to roast YouTube TV. Uh, The subscription TV platform service this week dropped SNY, Sports New York, uh, the New York Mets network from their TV sports lineup. And I know this doesn't affect people in Canada, Uh, But Met fans, including myself, I've had YouTube TV for over 10 years, so I could see all of the programming, all the content, all the history of the New York Mets, uh, and it's gone. As of July the 1st, at 12.01 a.m., SNY was removed uh, from the YouTube TV lineup, uh, and so at 12.02, I canceled my 10-year subscription. So I am personally roasting YouTube TV. They took Hey, Johnny, do you ever think maybe they're doing you a favor instead of having to sit there and watch all that Mets <laughs> new noise on this this particular year? It's I'm like a master kid. Uh, I'm gosh, a dog. Kid. It's, <laughs> <laughs> hey, it hasn't affected me, put it that way. <laughs> but, but, yeah, it's sad for me, but what am I going to do? I have the MLB Network subscription, so I'll see the Mets games, uh, uh, but all that other content, I'm going to miss dearly. But I won't move back to New York. I'll, I'll, hey, I'll, you're, hey, you're, hey, you're living in Nashville. Maybe you ought to jump on board the Atlanta Braves, which you ought to do. Oh, wow, what a great franchise they are. My goodness, I mean, they're amazing. <laughs> and now we have the toast of the week. And this one is kind of a no-brainer, John. Yankees started Domingo Herman tossed the 24th perfect game in Major League Baseball history. He did that against the Oakland A's last week. It was the first perfect game since 2012. So we got to give him a toast. Oh, yeah. You know, perfection. You know what? He must have found out the right uh, sticky stuff, man, or something. Huh? That's right, because he was <laughs> suspended for it uh, in May. He got that 10-game uh, suspension and was ejected from the game. Uh, well, valuable lesson, though. Maybe he didn't need that after all, right? Obviously, Maybe he didn't. Perfect game. He didn't. I do have a, a little bit of a trivia fact for you, John. Uh, the Yankees have now had four perfect games in their storied history. Darn Lawson, of course, pitched the first one in the World Series in 1956. David Wells had one in 1998. And David Cohn, as we mentioned here on the podcast in a previous episode, had one in 1999 on Yogi Berra Day in front of both Berra and Don Larson. Uh, Gibby, do you know what those other three perfect games in Yankees history have in common? Well, two of the three were Blue Jays. I don't know if it was Don Larson ever a Blue Jay. No, Don was not a Blue Jay. However, the previous three perfect games in Yankees history, in those three years, the Yankees went on to win the world championship. Well, you can forget that this year. They don't get Judge (laughs) back. Yeah, I don't, even, I don't even can. think they'll get in. I don't even think they'll get in if if he stays out for any or remainder of the year. Yeah, too valuable. You see it, you know. Yeah, yeah. He uh, it takes for crying out loud. They're scuffling. They just they lost a couple there in St. Louis. Yeah, they they need a, they they need their pitchers to throw perfect games to win over there right now. Seems well, seems that way. Corner booths, sticky floors, weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite. Great taste, 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. All right, John, that'll wrap up this edition of the Gibby Show. For John Gibbons, this is John Arezzi. We will talk more baseball with you right here next week. Have a great week, everybody, and go Blue Jays.